What's up, everybody? Welcome into Talking Pro Football. I'm your host, Philip Jordan, from Last World College Football, a 96.9 legend in Dothan, Alabama, where I'm the in-studio host and producer for Dothan Woods Football. This is your weekly look at all things pro football, especially in the National Football League. You can follow me on social media at PJordanSCC, and you can find the podcast on Twitter at Talking NFL Pod. The podcast is available on all your favorite podcast platforms, and if you're on Apple Podcasts, please subscribe, rate, and review. Leave a review. I will read it on a future edition of the show. And you can always email me at sportstalkfieldjordan at gmail.com. Everybody joining me this week on the show is Alan Bell, longtime friend of all the podcasts I've done over the years. Uh, you can check him out over at CBS Sports Line. And Alan, as always, it's good to have you on the show. Man, good to be back, buddy. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, glad to have you all. And I guess, you know, me and you talked about here, I'm kind of got this little mini podcast network, I guess, talking SEC, talking pro football. I'm just talking something, I guess, all the time. And it's, uh, it is, like I said, it's always, it's always good to have you on. Uh, you know, we, we're down to uh, four teams left in the, in the NFL playoffs, the AFC and NFC championship games this weekend. But, you know, I guess before we do that, for listeners, maybe, you know, maybe first time checking out me or, you know, or checking out what's going on CBS Sports Line, I'll tell them about what you guys do over there. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, what we want to do is, uh, is you know, uh, sports betters, you know, an edge, right? So we're going to, you know, comb through all the data, information, um, our own, um, you know, kind of algorithms that we've built. And we're going to uh, take all of that, project out scores, uh, grade bets for you, um, and also project out, you know, uh, player statistics. So in terms of player props, fantasy, et cetera, things like that. So anything that you do, you know, Beyond the game, we're the spot for you. So yeah, sportsline.com. Click around, check it out. I think you'll enjoy it. Yeah, everybody, everybody should go check it out. Uh, from, yeah, you guys do a fantastic job with everything y'all do. So I, I do re- highly recommend it to everybody listening out there to check out CBS Sportsline. And uh, we're, we're going to hit on a couple topics here. There's been look, there's been a lot of NFL news, and I, I said today I, I'm going to wait till after the season to jump on the coaching changes because there's so much going on with that <laughs> uh, right now, and we, we're going to. Dive and let the audience know we're going to dive in the, at the end to a little uh, college football talk as well, which you guys can also hear that segment on the Talk SEC podcast. But I did want to start off with we are recording this on Thursday night, so early on Thursday, podcast releasing on Friday. But uh, Ted Thompson, former Green Bay Packers general manager, passed away at age 68, kind of, I guess, caught everybody by surprise and everything. Just, I don't know, would, would you, Alan, just, you know, speak as what he did? in the NFL with the Packers. I mean, just what are your thoughts on Ted Thompson? Yeah, so, you know, you're talking about a guy who, you know, pretty much spent his entire life, you know, in the NFL. He, he played 10 years, uh, you know, most uh, notably, the, the, the obviously, the, the Houston Oilers. Um, but, you know, excuse me, really what he's known for, you know, is his work with the Green Bay Packers, you know, in the front office, you know, uh, you know, eventually becoming – uh, the general manager, and, you know, he was, you know, the one behind uh, the move to uh, to draft Aaron Rodgers, you know, while they had, uh, you know, kind of to the tail end of the, the Brett Favre era, you know, so to say. And, uh, yeah, that both kind of worked out, you know what I mean? But, you know, <laughs> there were so many other things. Like, you know, that that's obviously the one, you know, that, that you know, is the most, uh, I guess, you know, notable. But, you know, understand, I mean, the, the Green Bay Packers were a winning franchise, as they've, you know, pretty much always been. Uh, he had a lot to do with that. You know, he won two Super Bowls over there. So, uh, hate to hear it. Very sad, man. Um, but, you know, it's somebody that, uh, you know, should be honored uh, and cherished for his time in the NFL, man. He he, he really did a, uh, a fantastic job. And you could tell, you could always tell, you know, uh, beyond the sadness, you know, the situation like this, when so many people speak out and, you know, it's just positive thing after positive thing after positive thing. Like, you can tell the impact that he had on so many people and you know while again i mean it's a sad situation um you know that that's kind of the positive you could take that this guy lived a full life and he meant a lot to a lot of people and he helped a lot of people so um you know hate to see the uh, news of that but he was a a good man yeah i know i saw the comments that aaron Rodgers put out on thursday about it too and you bring that up with with that decision his first draft to draft Aaron Rodgers. That's his first draft pick as a general manager uh, when you had Brett Favre still there. And then three years later, look, he made a decision. You know, when Favre did his first, ret- you know, announced his retirement that offseason, decided to come back, he, they stood their ground. 
and decided to go with Aaron Rodgers instead of Favre. I mean, that could have been one of those situations that could have blown up in his face, and then you don't see him there for Packers a while. You probably get fired. And I think a lot of what people oh, don't that, talk yeah, about. That's a, that's a job-losing decision. Yeah. 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 And then the job he did building that team first – Okay, the team that won the Super Bowl the 2010 season with Aaron Rodgers. But also, I don't know if a lot of people have to remember, Favre's last year in 07, they were in overtime against the Giants. They were a player or two away from getting to the Super Bowl to play the undefeated New England Patriots with that young roster that Ted, Ted Thompson put together. So just you know what he did in those few years spans, building that team to what they were and putting that team around Brett Favre first and then Aaron Rodgers. I mean, he did a tremendous job of just team building overall. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and that's why, you know, it's like, you know, everybody will go to the Aaron Rodgers move because that was, you know, kind of the marquee. Um, was, uh, imagine that being your first decision, too. You know, like, that, that's yeah. pretty tough. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that you know, that, that was kind of, you know, my point as well is that, you know, beyond that, I mean, he did so much more. Um, and, you know, any time that you're, you know, in a high-level position and you, and you build a team and a roster – you know, that ultimately ends up winning a Super Bowl. Like, uh, you're a pretty important person, and uh, you know what you're doing. So, yeah, I mean, that's all I got to say. Like, you know, that, that's the one thing that, that people will hit on. But, you know, this guy did a whole lot more beyond that. He, he was fantastic at what he did. Yeah, I mean, you look at Clay Matthews, Greg Jennings, uh, Jordy Nelson. Uh, the, the list goes on and on of players that, you know, that he brought in there. And you're talking about the Aaron Rodgers thing, uh, and I follow Andrew Brandt on Twitter, and I, he was talking about it because he was with the Packers uh, with with Thompson there. And uh, he Ted Thompson looked at him. I guess he looked at Ted Thompson when they got to pick, and he said, Ted Thompson said, trust the board. And Aaron Rodgers' name was there, and they <laughs> trusted the board. So there you go. You, you, they got their quarterback, and uh, you know we're going to get to Aaron Rodgers and the Packers a little bit when we jump into the NFC Championship game. But – Get looking at a guy that's at 37, looked like he's probably going to win the MVP award. So I think that pick, yeah, it, it worked out just a little bit uh, for the Packers. Now, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is a workout. Just a little bit. Man, and, you know, and I'm going to say this I don't normally do this. I don't usually pull back the curtain a little bit, but the Packers fan base has been very, very spoiled in the last 30 years. And I will admit, I will admit here on the podcast that I am a Packers fan. Just it's just to let everybody know that, and there is spoiler riches, and I think that's another thing. I think just overall talking about the Packers. I mean, I know people get mad and aggravated. They've only won two Super Bowls with two of the greatest quarterbacks ever played the game. You know how many franchises out there wish they had two Super Bowls in that in that span? <laughs> you know, and have two quarterbacks oh, at that yeah. level. So it, that's kind of one thing that sticks out for me with that franchise too. Oh, no doubt. Like, in, in, yeah, I mean, only two Super Bowls. There's a lot of franchises that would love to have one Super Bowl at any time. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's not easy to win Super Bowl. And, you know, you look at, you know, the teams that have won multiple, there's not a whole lot of them. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, it, it's, you know, that, that list, once you win more than one, especially, you know, let's just, you know, say since, you know, 1990, 2000, whatever, like, dude, you're doing something right. You know, so, I mean, this, you know, it goes to speak to that franchise for sure. A guy that wish he had a Super Bowl, and uh, he retired this week. That is uh, that is Phillip Rivers. And, you know, I, I had always hoped that he could have maybe got to a Super Bowl with the Chargers or maybe this could have been it, hit, get lightning a bottle with the Colts. And they could have got to a Super Bowl. But, man, just the career he had. And I, I put it out there on my Twitter account. I did a poll, and I said, is Philip Rivers a Hall of Famer? I believe he is when you look at where he ranks all time and all these stats. Top five in yards, top five in touchdown passes. Um, I think a lot of times he was just in bad situations with the Chargers where there just really wasn't a, a lot around him. Uh, when, when you look at the, the career of Philip Rivers, uh, what is your thought now that he has decided to retire? Yeah, you know, I, I think the first thing is, I, I think we yeah. all kind of wish you know, that he got a Super Bowl or had an opportunity, you know, to play for one because, you know, Rivers is that guy who, I, I, you know, really, you know, whoever you're a fan of, like, I, I don't ever hear anybody, like, have a negative take on Rivers. Like, you might hate playing against him, and, you know, and, and that's perfectly fine. You, you know, you might be an AFC West rival, you know, when he's with the Chargers forever. Um, but, you know, nobody, ever, you know, it was never personal. Like, even if, you know, you hated, you know, the guy because he played on your rival team, you still respected the guy. You know what I mean? And that's kind of the biggest takeaway is that, you know, Rivers was a guy who, 
you know, just gave it everything that he had, man. Like, this dude went out. He won a whole lot of games. I know, obviously, again, you know, never got a ring. But, I mean, this dude, did, this dude won a lot, you know, in the NFL. And he put up, you know, some, some fantastic numbers. Uh, he's a tough son of a gun. And, uh, and you know, he, he – his energy and you know his passion for the game and his teammates, man, like it's it's fantastic. And I know that you know, he's moving on to the next part of his career. He's going to coach high school football in uh, Alabama. Uh, let me say this: uh, kids are going to love playing for this dude. Like he he is he does everything the right way. He's going to teach the kids, you know, not only how to play football and, and grow, you know, in terms of that, in terms of the sport, but he, you know, he, he he's like your perfect epitome of like a high school coach mentor type guy that, that you wish you had, right? Because he, he's mm-hmm. going to teach you other things off the field too, how to be a good person, how to be a leader in a community, you know, how to think beyond football, how to, you know, take care of finance, like everything. Like he, he's literally just a good human being. Um, so, you know, I, I hate that we're not going to have him in the league anymore, but man, tip of the cap to it. That, like, he, he did it right for a whole long, a long time. Yeah, you know, there's always that phrase that you will run through a brick wall through your coach. I have a feeling his players going to be like that at Fairhope. I mean, that that's just, yeah. Yeah. I mean, just the attitude, the intensity that he brings. I mean, that I think, for, especially at the high school level, that's going to connect. Oh, big time. Absolutely, it will. Like, I, I, the kids are going to love him. The community's going to love him. You know, and I mean, you know, let's be honest. I mean, you know, he, he's from down there. Like, you know, he. He's already, you know, beloved, you know, by the people. But I mean, they're they're, they're going to eat him up, like they're, like in a good way. Like they're just going to love having that guy. It, it, that's that's a huge benefit, man, for everybody involved in that school and that community. Uh, he, he he literally is that good of a person. Like he, he'll make a difference uh, for everybody involved. I, you know, I've got to wonder with Tommy Toberville and Dennis Franchoni when they were coaching Toberville at Auburn, Franchoni at Alabama. I believe it was Franchoni. I do know the stories. I've heard the stories that they told him they wanted him to play at safety because he would never make it as a quarterback. I, I do sometimes wonder if one of those coaches is ever losing sleep at night because they, they told Phillip Rivers that and didn't have him on their <laughs> roster. Yeah, not a good decision there. <laughs> it's the same thing that, you know, uh, you hear the stories of, you know, people said to Derrick Henry, like, ah, you know, maybe running back's not your position. Well, you know what? I kind of think it is. It, it yeah. doesn't work out for him. Just a little bit. And, you know, and I hate it. And the one thing I hate it for the high school kids, I mean, how you, how you going to go up to Phillip Rivers and say, Coach, I'm, I'm too hurt to play when your coach played in the AFC Championship game against New England Patriots for the torn ACL? Yeah. yeah exactly, man. Like, this dude's tough. Like, you, you know, he, he's not going to put any kids in bad positions, but you're also going to learn, you know, the, the difference of, you know, are you injured or are you hurt? You know what I mean? Like, he – he, he's going to teach kids to be tough. He, he's going to be fantastic, man. He yeah. really is. Yeah, and, and so quickly before we do jump into the AFC and NFC Championship games for this weekend, w- with the Colts, where, where do you think they go now quarterback? Because I know I saw, you know, they wanted Rivers to come back for another year because Rivers showed this year he still has some left. He's still a very good quarterback. You know, he can help a team win games. I mean, do you think they maybe go draft, a free agency, trade, or just kind of maybe roll with Jacoby Brissett next year? Well, that's the thing is that they're in such a great spot, you know, that you have Jacoby there, you know, kind of as your insurance plan. Um, they could go any number one of those routes, and it's impossible to check right now um, because, you know, they they don't know. You know, yeah. you've got to take, you know, kind of a 30,000-foot view, you know, of the situation. But here is where they're set, is that, one, you've got your set there, so you've got, you know, kind of that, that ace, you know, up your sleeve. Two, they've got a ton of money to spend in free agency if they want to. Three, they're fantastic in the draft, and there's a ton of, you know, good quarterbacks that are coming up. Um, so, I mean, they, you know, they, they've got options. You know, whatever is going to make sense for them, uh, they'll go after it. You know, and Chris Ballard is a, a heck of a GM. For Indy, uh, Frank Wright, obviously, is a fantastic coach, offensive play cover type guy. Like, they, they're, they're in about as good of a spot as you could be, you know, to kind of find your next guy. Yeah, I think that's going to be a fun thing to watch with them. Just you know, just see what they do because 
they got talent, and so a quarterback's going to be in a good p- position there. Uh, whoever is the quarterback for the Colts next season, uh, and now as we do, you know, move into the games for this Sunday, I, I've always wished they would just play one game Saturday, one game Sunday, because you know sometimes these two games is a lot to take in on just one day, especially if they're back to back to each other like they are. But of course, the first one is the NFC Championship game. The Packers are playing the Buccaneers. Aaron Rodgers surprising a lot of people. I think a lot of people just did not realize. He had never played a home NFC Championship game. And uh, he's getting at this year going up against the GOAT, Tom Brady. Just this matchup, just what's the first thing you think about when you hear Buccaneers, Packers, NFC Championship? Yeah, I mean, you know, you're going to go straight to the quarterbacks, right? Like yeah. You're going to get Aaron Rodgers versus Tom Brady. <clears throat> so that, I mean, that, that, you know, alone, that's your marquee. But, you know, you've got two really good football teams that, you know, are, are hitting their peaks at the right time. Um, and you've got, you know, a Bucks defense, obviously, we saw last week against uh, the Saints. You know, they pretty much ate Drew Brees up, um, you know, so they're looking to, you know, create turnovers, um, you know, continue the success that they've had, stop the run game, um, and then, you know, obviously, like you said, well, you know, you could want to do that all you want, but you're going up against, you know, the MVP and Aaron Rodgers, who this is how good this guy has been this year. He had more touchdown passes than the Packers as a team had punts. That's a real stat. Like, they are not I – mean, not only did Aaron Rodgers have such a phenomenal year, but this team is incredibly efficient. And look at what they're doing. You know, their last four games, you know, they've only allowed teams to score 18 points or fewer. You know, so so they're, they're not only, you know, playing defense, uh, but, you know, they, they obviously use their offense as a defense. Um, and, you know, Aaron Rodgers last week, you know, pretty much ate up the number one defense in the NFL at the Rams. Um, you know, I know that Aaron Donald had injuries, et cetera, but just goes to show, like, what a high level that guy's playing at right now. So, yeah, long story short, like, you know, Rodgers versus Brady for sure, but these are two really good teams. You know, with Rodgers, and coming into this year, of course, you know, they drafted Jordan Love in the first round, so you just kind of wonder how much longer will Aaron Rodgers be with the Packers? Is it going the same route that went with Brett Favre? And in the last couple of years, you could see he, he was not at this level or the level that he had been at before. So coming into this year, did you maybe have think, you know, I think some people had this thought that Aaron Rodgers may be slipping a little bit, still one of the better quarterbacks in the league, but was not as good as he was. Um, excuse me. Uh, not Aaron, but the team. Yes. Like I, I, I honestly didn't think. <laughs> excuse me. I honestly didn't think that the Packers were going to be able to replicate what they did last year, right? Like, I, and again, that, that's not necessarily on Rodgers. It was more on the talent on the team. And you know, you kind of looked around. And you're like, all right, you know, Aaron Jones is all right to run back. You know, you've got Devontae Adams. Obviously, you know, he is who he is. But you know, there, there wasn't a ton that really stuck out. You know what I mean? Like, you looked at, like, you know, coming in, let's just say coming into the year. You looked at teams like the 49ers. I mean, just loaded across the board. You know what I mean? You looked at the, at the Saints, uh, you know, loaded with talent across the board. Um, you know, the, the Chiefs, the Ravens. Like, there are, there are so many other teams that you look at and you're like, man, these teams are going to be just phenomenal. Like, I don't think the Packers are going to be bad. <clears throat> but, you know, I, I just don't know how far necessarily they're going to go. And, uh, I mean, Aaron Rodgers has just laughed at that. Like, he, he is – not that he's the only person, because obviously he's not. But, dude, I, I mean, you know, you look at him. Like, last week against the Rams, literally the best defense in the NFL, he looked like a dad, like, playing dodgeball in the yard with his kids. Like, he could do whatever he wanted. He could put the ball wherever he wanted. He wasn't – there was never a moment of concern that you even thought, like, the Rams are going to win that game. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's how good this dude is. And, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if he does it again this week. I'm not saying that it's going to be a blowout or anything, but, like, he's just that good. And, you know, he, if he doesn't turn the ball over, which he clearly rarely ever does, like, good luck, man. Like, just good luck because they're playing good enough defense and everything else that you can have a good game, but he's probably going to have a better one. How, how much of an impact – I mean, obviously, I mean, there will be fans there. There's not a lot of fans. But how much of an impact or how much importance do you put in the fact that this game is being played at Lambeau? Oh, I mean, uh, you know, a lot. And, and, you know, in the sense of this, um, Aaron Rodgers made it a point this year that he wanted this game at home, uh, and he got it. And, you know, I know that you know, the, the crowd isn't going to be, you know, 100% at capacity, et cetera. That, that part really doesn't matter. 
um, you know, at least for that team. I, I think it's just the comfortability of playing at home. Uh, and and I, I think this team honestly plays better when it's cold. Like, you know, and, you know, trust me, Tom Brady ain't afraid of cold either. He's done it his entire career. But there's just something about this Packers team playing at Lambeau that they, they just feel comfortable. It feels like a preseason game to them. You know what I mean? Like, they could just operate at maximum efficiency. Uh, so I, I think it's I think it's huge for them. Um, you know, and, and then, you know, here's another side. Think about this. You know, the Bucks are playing their third straight road playoff game. Mm-hmm. And I went back and looked at the last seven, you know, the last seven games where a team was playing his third, you know, playoff game on the road. And those teams are one in six. Like, it, that, that part means something. So, you know, not having to travel, sleeping in your own bed, um, that that's I think that's the biggest part, especially when you look at two quarterbacks who I'm 36 years old, so I'm not calling anybody old, but just for like you know the uh, the, the age of playing in the NFL, you know for for you know two quarterbacks like sleeping in your own bed matters, taking a shower in your own shower, like all of those kind of comforts. I, I really do think like it, it plays a little bit into it. You know what I mean? It's easier yeah. to do that at home, you know, than it is on the road. And, you, you know, Trevor Bay wise and. Look, I'm, right. I'm not ignoring Tom Brady. I mean, he he has done great this year. But their defense. I mean, I think that's really. I mean, Brady gets a lot of the attention. You got Gronk, you got Antonio Brown, you got Mike Evans. I mean, you got so many big name players. I think people know who they are on that offense. But defensively, the Buccaneers are really good. You know, in that first matchup, they were down in Tampa, and, and it was Week Six. I don't think you can take a whole lot from it saying that's going to impact what happens this Sunday. But they did get two interceptions off Aaron Rodgers after Packers jumped out 10 to nothing. They looked dominant. I mean, it looked like it was going to be a runaway with the Packers in that game. The turnovers, Devin White, what he can do for this defense. I mean, they got players all over the field for Tampa Bay. So when you look at for them going up against this Packer offense, where do you see maybe some spots where they can take advantage of some things? Yeah, the front seven. So, you know, you look, you look at their, you know, Statistics they had this year, you know, playing against the run, they've, they've essentially eliminated that. And, you know, going into last week, <clears throat> excuse me, in the playoff round, like, I, I took I, I took the Bucks, like, bet the money line, you know, uh, against, you know, didn't even worry about, you know, the spread. Because I knew that the Saints weren't not, they were not going to be able to run the ball. And Drew Brees' arm was not going to be strong enough, um, you know, to, to really, you know, attack deep down the field. I didn't think that they'd have that many turnovers, um, but the defense is good. Like that, that that's really the point that I'm getting at. And you know, they could really put you in some bad spots. The tough part is that their secondary is reeling a little bit. So that you know, obviously, is worrisome. Um, you know, going up against Aaron Rodgers. But you know, back to the, the the question, their front seven, you know, could really cause you some fits. They could take away your run game. They could take away the flats. You know, and Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady both use their running backs in short, you know, short yards past the attack, kind of to, to create even more of a run game. They, they use it as a run game, right? Well, Tampa's defense is fast enough side to side to where they, you know, the, 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 it's not going to take it away completely, but they're going to limit you. You know what I mean? Like you, your normal nine yard swing pass type plays, you know, go for two. You know, so it, it puts you in a tough spot. Like Aaron Rodgers is going to have to earn it. Like it's not going to be free. Yeah, and he, that's been the whole thing since this, you know we knew this matchup was going to you know happen between these two. I said defensively. I mean, and look, and Tampa Bay likes to run the ball, and the Packers defense has played better last few season, and they played well last week against the Rams. But this year, when they did struggles against the physical teams on the defense side, maybe slowing down the run game, being able to get pressure on Aaron Rodgers, and then going against you know a, a good running game, which that's something the Buccaneers they can do well. So I was thinking. That might be some interesting things there, but um, uh, other than that, you know, what is for you? You know, it, it's something we haven't mentioned for this Packers Buccaneers game. What's what's going to be the the key ingredient for either team to come out victorious? Uh, I, I think for me, it's just going off of what the Packers have been doing. Like, <clears throat> excuse me, you, you look at the last seven games, the Packers have won by seven plus points. Okay. Uh, go again, you know, what I said, the last four games, their defense has allowed 18 points or fewer. And it's not that their defense is like the best in the NFL. It's good. It's a lot better. But what they do is they use their offense as a defense. Aaron Rodgers keeps you off the field, right? Like he's good at doing that. He can extend drives. They can score in two plays. They can score in 10 plays. 
So if you look at, you know, kind of a time of possession, and then if you look at uh, points per possession, Green Bay is the best team in the NFL in terms of points per possession. It's generally, you look after a game, it's about 3.1 almost, which is phenomenal, right? If you're getting three points, three points, like you're scoring every drive at, you know, at, at some capacity of points, you're pretty tough to beat. You know what I mean? Like, you, you, you look last week, I think they only had two drives or they didn't put up any points. Um, and, and generally, they convert those to touchdowns as well. I, I think that they have the fewest field goal attempts uh, in the NFL. So, uh, you know, a long story short, like, it goes to – if Green Bay is efficient like that, I, I don't care who you are. So, like, you're not going to beat them. Like, you're just not because you're just not going to be perfect. And that's that's pretty much the level uh, that they've been playing at. So, that, that's really my, my, my two big keys. Uh, it's time of possession and points per possession. If Green Bay is leading in those, game over, man. No, and it, we look at the AFC Championship game. I mean, the Bills and the Chiefs. Okay, I was just going to say, I believe Mahomes is playing on Sunday. Where are you sitting with that? Oh, zero question. The guy's going to start. But here's my here's my question. Like, I, I'm not even concerned about the concussion part. My question is the toe. Yeah, like, I've seen what turf toe and those kind of things do. They get worse throughout the week. So I'm not saying that Mahomes, uh, Mahomes will start. But like, barring aliens coming to Earth, Patrick Mahomes is going to start the game Sunday. But my biggest question is, you know, how injured is that toe? What does it change with the play calling? And what I mean by it is this, is Patrick Mahomes has three straight playoff games with a rushing touchdown. What I mean by it is that, you know, when they get in the red zone, we saw it last week, you know, that, that run, you know, the option, the veer type plays, right, with Mahomes. Does that change? You know, does that, you know, does it change, you know, if they're at the 40, you know, and, and a play, you know, where Mahomes, you know, normally if a play, you know, breaks up and he takes off running for 10, 11 yards, you know, does that, does that change how they go about that? Like, I, I, I don't know if it does. It, it might not be injured that bad, but. That's my biggest concern. But, yeah, I mean, the, the guy is starting the game, no doubt. You know, and you mentioned that the toe situation, and I'm with you there because before he, he left the game with the concussion, there were some throws he sh- he was short on. Like, he, you know, like quarterbacks that need to be able to really, you know, use their feet and plant their feet right. I, I mean, I I may be wrong. I mean, I, look, I never played position – but that looked like maybe a foot a foot injury could have been hampering him with getting the balls where they need to be at times. I mean, there were some pretty ten yard passes that he was short on. So if he is not right there, that could be a big problem. Oh, absolutely. You know the key to the key to attacking Patrick Mahomes, which you know it, that could be a funny statement. There might not be any, you know, but but it, it's keeping him in the pocket and, and and making him legit a pocket passer, right? Like that that's not his strength. His strength is when a play breaks up, you know, and he rolls outside of the pocket. Not that he runs, because he doesn't, you know, rack up like a ton of rushing yardage per game, but that's where he just destroys you with his arm, right? Like, that's where guys like Tyree Kill, Travis Kelsey, the, you, you just can't guard those guys for seven, eight seconds, right? Like, it's just too hard. They're too good, too big, too fast. Uh, but if you keep him in the pocket and you force him to play from the pocket, you know, he, he he's not Peyton Manning in terms of, you know, accuracy, right? Like, that that's not his style. He could do it, but, you know, it, that that's how you get after him. So, you know, if that foot-toe injury is something and he's not as mobile as he generally is and the girls can find a way, you know, to keep him in there, uh, that's interesting. You know, and, and looking at the other side with Buffalo and Josh Allen and – you got to be so impressed with the improvements he's made since his rookie year and his, you know, from out, uh, Wyoming when he was there. I, mean, I got it right here, his completion percentage each year in the NFL. His rookie year, 2018, he was 53%. Last season, he was 59%. And this year, he jumps up to 69%. And quarterbacks can improve. I'm not saying they can't. I mean, but that is a stat that you rarely see that big of a jump, especially going from 59 to 69%. It's just incredible the the leaps this guy has made to be one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. Absolutely. You got to give him credit. Give the Bills credit. Uh, give Brian Gable credit. I think he's obviously a phenomenal, uh, you know, OC, um, you know, for exactly what Josh Allen wants to do. 
But yeah, I mean, Josh Allen has gotten much better. And, you know, I think the Stephon Diggs trade, obviously, uh, was massive for him. You look at, you know, Diggs. Diggs had 17 games this season with six-plus uh, receptions. Like, he is getting so many targets uh, that, that it, it's just phenomenal. Um, but it goes to show how good he is and, and the connection, you know, that Josh Allen and, uh, and Diggs have. But let me say this. I'll give you another stat that's even more phenomenal than that. Josh in the red zone, he has, I think it's 43 touchdown passes, 24 touchdown rushes, zero interceptions. Zero. Like, that's incredible, right? Like, and you're looking at a team that I think is at the top, if not the top, in terms of, you know, red zone conversions, in terms of touchdowns. Uh, and let me say this. There's a team left in the NFL playoffs that is both the worst red zone conversion defense in the NFL and has the worst point differential in the NFL since week 10. That's the Kansas City Chiefs. If you took the logos off the helmets and you put the stats down, the Buffalo Bills are playing so much better than the Kansas City Chiefs that it's not even funny. Like, it's literally, there's that large of a difference. The Chiefs haven't beat a team by more than six points since week eight. Okay? Like, now, I know, you know, games in the NFL are tight, but what I'm saying is this, is that this is not the exact same Chiefs team that we've seen, you know, last year, et cetera. Don't get me wrong, they're winning games. But the Buffalo Bills are winning games, too. And you look at, you know, the, 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 I think the Bills, their last, like, four or six games, they have a point differential of, like, plus 136. Like, they're not only winning games, they're blowing people out. Um, and their defense is showing up, too. We saw what they did last week against Baltimore. Um, it's hard for me. Like, it's hard for me to say the Bills are going to go in and absolutely win that game. But I'm kind of saying that, that if the Bills and Josh Allen don't kill themselves with fumbles or turnovers, uh, yeah, they're, they're a better team than the Kansas City Chiefs. I, and I realize what I just said. I, like, they're, they're, they're that good, man. Yeah, you know, and watch them all year. And trust me, I, I know all about. Diggs because he was on my fantasy team this year so I was very 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 happy <laughs> with the connection him and Josh Allen had all year that was that was week in week out pretty much a lot for me that I was going to get good numbers from Diggs and, but you know you talked about Josh Allen with his numbers in the red zone and and that's kind of where I wanted to go with this next talking about the rushing and with him you can tell this year Buffalo did not run him as much as they had the previous two seasons. And they've done a little bit more of it here in the playoffs. But do you expect on Sunday to the, for them to feature Josh Allen as a runner a little bit more than they have? Yeah, I, in the sense of I, I think they're, they're going to they're going to pull, all, all the, pull out all the stops. Like the, anything that's in the playbook is open. So I, I think that you're going to see, you know, when, when plays, you know, kind of break down, uh, if Josh Allen doesn't have, you know, just an immediate spot to put the ball, run. It, because it's good. It, what it does is it's going to, you know, keep the Chiefs defense honest. Because they know that, you know, Buffalo, Buffalo doesn't have a run game, which is, you know, it surprises us that good, you know, without a run game, you know, seemingly at all. Um, so, you know, if, if he can do that, he's going to find open spots in the flat that he can, you know, he can, he can gain six, seven, eight, ten, twelve yards, you know, and if he could do that a couple times, man, like that changes the way that the Chiefs play defense. Like they, you, they can't cheat, you know, you, you've got to yeah. kind of play it, uh, you know, honest and straight up. So yeah, I, I do. I don't think it's going to be a ton, but I, I, I would, I would absolutely feel comfortable, uh, you know, saying that, that Allen's going to have some rushing yards. He, he's going to definitely take advantage of that. So, you know, as I kind of said with the the Packers and Buccaneers, for you closing out this conversation with the Bills and Chiefs, what's the key Sunday for you? The key Sunday for me is the Bills and turnovers. If we see some of the fumbles out of Josh Allen, it's bad news. If we see, you know, a couple picks, that's bad news. Um, Because, we, you know, the Chiefs are – we know who they are. You know, I I said all the stats in the world about them, but you're going to have to go in and play almost a perfect game to take them out. Like, they're they're, they're that good. So, you know, it's really about Josh Allen and and the Bills. You know, if they're 
hurting themselves, if they're missing, you know, field goals, if they're dropping passes, you know, th- those things are going to catch up with you. It's just tough to beat the Chiefs. But if they are on, you know, and they're not turning the ball over and they're converting first downs, uh, buddy, look out. Because, again, like I said, the Bills are a better team than the Chiefs right now. Yeah, it's, it's going to be fun. I mean, and like I said, it feels like with the Chiefs, they're like a team. Like, I mean, if you're going to beat them, you need to knock them out because if you let them hang around, they're like that, that fighter. You, you need to knock them out early because if you let them hang around, and, yeah, you do. It, no, you you got to have yeah, you got to you got to have the Lane Kiffin type, you know, attitude towards it. Like you you got to just go for the kill. You yeah. really do because I mean we've seen the numbers are there for Mahomes. Like he's not afraid to come back either. You know, and, and then last night I did a top and. He, talk about you know you were there in the state of tennessee obviously uh it's had to be very good for the sports talk uh shows there on the radio in the state of tennessee particularly in knoxville this week with jeremy pruitt being fired and we're recording this on thursday and uh, a very impressive hire at athletic director with danny white coming in he was at central florida fantastic job there running that program particularly the football program what they've done just so you know Overall, you know, what's going on at Tennessee right now, a lot of stuff you're hearing, and uh, just overall that hire bringing in Danny White. Yeah, so, I mean, it's Tennessee, so, you know, you expect pure insanity every offseason. <laughs> uh, you know, it, I mean, seriously. Um, no, I mean, this situation has been brewing for a while. Um, you know, it's surprising that, you know, that, that they, you know, move so quick on, you know, getting rid of him. Uh, let, let's just call it like it is getting rid of Phil Fulmer, um, you know, as the athletic director, I know that, you know, he quote unquote retired. Uh, that's, uh, awful, interesting timing, you know, that he t- retired at that you know exact moment. Um, but th- th- that was a home run hire in terms of Danny White and the athletic director. Um, he is obviously, you know, all the work that he did at UCF. Um, he's a good one, man. And like, honestly, like it's the first time it feels like adults are running the program at Tennessee again. And it feels like the first time in a long time where, you know, Tennessee, you know, kind of saw their guy, who they wanted, and they went out and weren't taking no for answer, right? Like, we ponied up the money, and you make it work. Um, so I, I think it's a fantastic hire. We'll see what they do. You know, you still got a, you know, make a, a, head co- a head football coach, you know, decision on a hire now. But I think, you know, for any Tennessee fans out there, like, it, they, they feel a whole heck of a lot more comfortable today you know, than they did 24 hours ago. You know, and I guess to kind of close up, you know, my whole conversation here, with particularly the Tennessee part, uh, are there some names, you know, I, you know, I see the stuff in some articles, people, you know, floating out there, but, you know, you're up there. Uh, any names you're hearing that could be interesting for that job as the head coach? Yeah, so, you know, <clears throat> that's the interesting part is, like, you know, we kind of all have, you know, kind of the same list, you know, media-wise. Uh, guys like Billy Napier, guys like, uh, you know, Hugh Freeze is getting a lot of attention, obviously. Uh, guys like Gus Malzahn, um, you know, the, those names. You know, now that they, you know, that they made such, you know, kind of a splash hire in AD, um, and, you know, a guy that, you know, is, is uh, clearly going to be in charge and going to get who he wants, <clears throat> it changes the aspect of it. You know, I, I, I don't know, um, you know, necessarily who that person is going to be. Could come out of left field. But what I'll say is this. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, kind of anything is on the table. I'm not saying anyone is on the table, but Tennessee, you know, was kind of stuck with like three, four, five different guys that were the options. Now I think, you know, doors have been opened everywhere to where it could be a hire that nobody kind of thinks of. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. So, yeah. So, I mean, you know, long story short, I don't have a great answer for you right now, but. I, I I think that goes to show that there's a whole lot more options on the table now than there were, um, you know, earlier this week. All I gotta say about it is this: <clears throat> as a guy that writes about Auburn for last college football and followed the Auburn coaching search, if Gus Malzahn becomes the Tennessee head coach, Kevin Steele will once again become unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> So that's, I guess, you know, that's my, my two cents on, on, on that part. But uh, anyways, Alan, uh, appreciate it. I know I've uh, I've kept you long here on the podcast, a little bit longer probably than I, than I said I would. Uh, but I always do appreciate you taking the time out coming on the show, whatever, whichever podcast uh, I have you on. I always appreciate you taking the time. And if the listeners want to follow you online, where can they find you? Yeah, definitely, man. I appreciate you having me on, man. Thank you. 
Uh, yeah, you, you can find me at you know, sportsline.com, uh, or you can find me on Twitter at Alan Bell 247 And, uh, yeah, hit me up, man. We'll talk some ball. All right, sounds good, Alan. Uh, once again, appreciate the time, and I look forward to talking again sometime down the road. Hey, definitely, man. Thank you so much, buddy. Appreciate it. Everybody, that's going to do it for this edition of Talking Pro Football. Once again, thanks to Alan Bell for coming on the show. Fantastic conversation there. Talking about Ted Thompson, Phillip Rivers, and the AFC and NFC Championship Games. And we'll be back early next week on Tuesday is the plan with an episode recapping both of those games. And on that episode, I'll be joined by Blake Lovell, who is the host of the Established the Pass podcast, NFL Clutch Points. He will be on the show to recap all of that and probably some other NFL news that happens between now and Tuesday. And there will be a new episode of Talking SEC. Plan is for that to drop on Wednesday. And I'll be joined by Chris Gordy from Locked On SEC. And we're going to do a lot of topics. And I'm sure we'll have some Tennessee conversation in there for that. So please subscribe to this podcast. Talking Pro Football, and also subscribe if you haven't already to Talking SEC coming at you once a week with both shows throughout the offseason. And then, of course, when the season comes next year, we'll have you covered every single week as well. Remember, you can follow me on social media at P. Jordan SEC. You can follow this show on Twitter at Talking NFL Pod. So go check it out. Need to get the followers up on that Twitter account. Remember, you can find a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. And if you are on Apple Podcasts, please subscribe, rate, and review. If you leave me a review, I will read it on a future edition of the show. Anyways, guys, hope you have a great weekend. Until next week, bye-bye.